Good morning. Man, has song service blessed your heart this morning? It's been good, amen? You got to get excited about being in the Lord's house. You know, um, I was pretty excited. I mean, getting to preach this morning, it's always uh, awesome to get to preach, but when you got a morning service, that's even better. And then when you're not preached in a couple of weekends consecutively, woo, you ready, right? It's like revival time. Y'all bring your lunch, got your snacks. Man, I'm excited. But getting there is the problem, right? A lot of times getting ready for something that the Lord wants us to do, that's not the exciting part. Amen? Now, y'all live a total different life than I do, right? But getting here, that wasn't the exciting part. And, and Brother Sheely, we spoke at the first week, and he said, man, is, is it going pretty good? I said, it's going real good. I said, it's something that, that's never happened to me before. The Lord gave me a title. See, Keith liked to pass out just then. Because they record these messages, and Keith comes to me and says, Ben, I need a title. And I'm like, I don't know how to title anything. And I said, the Lord gave me a title, so I'm going to work on it. And that was, it's been two weeks. And guess what? Title changed. <laughs> I look, I, seriously, I, I got in there, and I was digging and reading, and I got to looking, and I said, man, 100%. Amen? 100%. And then I got to all in, and then I got to surrender all. Amen? Y'all ain't even liking this already, are you? You're like, man, just sit down, brother. Sheely, step up there. Right? Because we're, we're getting into, man, what I got to change. Right? That's where I've been all two weeks. What I got to change. Man, Lord, are you sure? Oh, what are you doing? But then this week, I've talked to three different people. And you know what they said? And I've said this before. They said, well, you know of you, the, the Christian, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? The, the Christian. I'm going to use this term loosely, the Christian. You know what? This week, that has just ticked me off. I'll be honest with you. Absolutely making me mad. Why? Because, folks, Christian is not a term to, lose, to use loosely. And I've got a problem with it. And I've said it before. I've said it up here before. But the more I think about it, the better I get. Why? Because we shouldn't use that term loosely. And the problem is, is we are Christians or letting it. Mm -hmm. The problem is, we started letting the world set the definition for our terms. And we ain't doing nothing about it. Man. I've been getting my rear end kicked, folks, studying up on this. You know, the Lord's just been hammering me. Why do they use that term loosely? Well, Ben Britton, they use it loosely because you don't do what you're supposed to do. Because, Ben Britton, you've let the world set the definitions for what the Christian is. Man, that means who failed. But you know what? Jesus Christ didn't fail. I want you to open your Bibles. Look at Acts. I want you to go back. We're going to go back. We're going to look at where the term Christian come from. Christian. In Acts chapter 1, that's where we're going to start talking at. We're going to go from Acts chapter 1 to chapter 2. We're going to read some in chapter 2. We won't go into 3, so it's okay. Y'all was thinking you're finna be here reading for a while, but it's okay. We're just going to read a little bit in chapter 1. We're going to go to chapter 2, and then we're going to look back through all the Gospels. <laughs> Amen? So, just open your Bible anywhere. We'll be there in a minute. In the New Testament. Okay? I'm excited, guys. This is a good place to be. Look around, look at your neighbor and say, man, this is a good place to be. Yeah! How many of you convinced your neighbor? Huh? It's good. Let's go to the, to the word. Let's make it better. 
In Acts chapter 1, verse 13, it says, And when they were come in, they went into the upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now understand what was happening. This was after Jesus Christ died on the cross. This was after he was placed in the tomb. And this was after they realized he wasn't in the tomb anymore. And this was after they stood there watched him ascend into heaven. Amen? Folks, listen, if you're not excited this morning, you better be after that point. They watched him ascend into heaven. Alive. He wasn't in that tomb no more. Praise the Lord. I worship a Savior that is living. Man, that's good. You know why? Because I know he can be there whenever I need him. And you know what? He's there when I don't think I need him. That's even better. But this is after all that took place, and they all gathered up in the upper room, and you know who was there? It was the first church. And you know what they was doing there? They was waiting on something. Jesus Christ told them, this is where you're going to go, this is where you're going to be, and I want you to stay there. Because i got something coming for you. I'm going to send a comfort. That's good. You hear me? Because Jesus told them, I'm sending you something. So they was all gathered up there, the first church, and the best part about it was, it says, these all continued with what? One accord in prayer. Folks, does Bay Lake want something to start happening? Let's gather up and start praying together. Let's all get in one accord. You know what? We want the word Christian to quit being used loosely. Let's gather up and start praying about it. All of us together. You know why? Because then it matters. Because we're not being selfish no more. Man, how I like to be selfish. Because then it lightens the mood for everybody else, right? No more pressure on everybody. If I'm selfish, everybody else can be selfish. Amen? But one accord, whoo, reckon how sweet it would be. Reckon how much Bay Lake community could change. You know, since I've been here, I've heard people tell me how much the community's changed. I didn't grow up here. And I look around now and people come to me and say, man, used to, this place was packed. Man, used to, we'd have tent revival, Right? Folks, it's not just here, it's everywhere. But that's what you get. Man, used to. You want to know why? Because Christian meant something. And when the church had a function, people showed up because their priorities was right. Because Jesus meant something. But now we live in a selfish world where the world de de depicts the definition that's used and we listen to it. Folks, Christian was something that stood out, that stood up. And stood against. And now we just sit down. We shut up. We be quiet. And we blend in. And that's a problem. When the world starts depicting the definition of the church. Folks we got a problem. And that's what's happening. A Christian should stand out. My Bible says a Christian should be different. My Bible says people should be able to look at a Christian. And say wow that's a Christian. But where are we at today? Hmm? You know, are we a Christian? Or are we just playing like a Christian? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe that's just my thinking. In verse 15, in the same chapter, chapter 1, it says, The number of names together were about 120. Could you imagine? Listen, this study in this, and, and, and my mouth is dry this morning. 
studying this, I've been looking back on last year. Last year, last month, I had the biggest, one of the biggest blessings in my life about traveling to Israel. And I got to see things that brought my Bible to a whole new perspective on certain things. So when I was reading this, and there's 120 people gathered up in the room, and we're all gathered up here, and we're sitting there, and man, we got room to breathe, don't we, Miss Theo? You ain't got to sit right up beside me, do you? Uh -uh. We got room to move. It's comfortable, and the lights is on, and the air conditioning's going, right? Preacher may talk too much, but it's still good. Amen? We all got our Bibles laid out in our lap. If we don't have our Bibles, maybe we got our cell phones going. Man, it's just good, right? But let me tell you, when I was in Israel and I went to that upper room, um, it wasn't near this big. Those folks was probably shoulder to shoulder. You know what? They've been running since Jesus Christ had been captured. So they probably ain't none of them had baths in a little while. Can you imagine? Somebody walks in here right now and sits down. We're so comfortable as a Christian that if they smell bad, we might move, right? <laughs> they didn't have that choice. So I can picture them being shoulder to shoulder in one accord, kneeled down praying. Not 12 of them. Not 11 plus Mary and, and, and Jesus' mother Mary. Not 13 of them. 120 of them. In one accord. Amen. Kneel down praying. And what was they praying for? The same thing. And that was that comforter that Jesus Christ was talking about. That Holy Spirit. And folks, listen to me. You and I get that same thing when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. But do we let it make a difference? Do we let it make a difference? Because we're going to get off in chapter 2, and guess what? You're going to see a difference that was made. The Holy Spirit came down on those 120 that were gathered up there. And oh my, it was good, folks. You know what? They got excited. And you say, well, brother, listen, I'm going to tell you, that was the first Baptist church. And they got excited. You hear me? We must be like the thousandth Baptist church. Right? Because it says they started talking. Every one of them started talking. <laughs> Woo, that's good. I'm excited, guys. Listen, you know why? Because they was in one accord, and they was all there for one reason, and they was following Jesus Christ. When that Holy Spirit come in and wrapped them up, they all got excited about it. You hear me? They all started talking to each other about what? About Jesus. Maybe that's our problem. We want to come in here sit out on our comfortable pews, and we want to talk about the weather. We want to talk about so-and-so that has cancer. We want to talk about all the problems in the world, but we don't want to talk to each other about Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you want to get excited, start sharing with somebody about Jesus. Let them share back. I'm telling you right now, you can walk on cloud nine. You can skip out of this church house. Woo we're pushing the line there, ain't we? We can't get that excited about Jesus, can we? Let me tell you something. We need to. There's a world out there that is dying and going to hell, and you know why they're doing it? Because we as Christians are depressed. And that world is showing them a lot more fun than what we're showing them. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ is something to be excited about. And if we got excited about it, people would start coming to us and saying, Hey, man, what do you have that I don't have? And you know what I can share with them? I got the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that that 120 got in that room, and the same Holy Spirit that I'm going to tell you about Peter stepping out and talking about. And he was excited about it, and so am I. Can you get that way? Can you get that way? Listen, 
We will drive around and we'll look depressed and we'll get excited when we get a picture of our grandkids. We get excited when, when my mama sends me a picture of my daddy catching a bass. I'm like, man, good job. I get excited when my brother sends me a big old buck that he shot. And I'm, whoa, look at that. I get excited when my boys come home with a good report. But folks, when do we get excited about Jesus? Hmm? Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 14 is where we're going to start at. It says, But Peter, standing up with eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I told you we wasn't going through the Old Testament, but we are. <laughs> Ain't that good? He said, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all the flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I like hearing some amens there. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. He being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make full of the joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruits of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make the foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom he hath crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen? Amen. Folks, let me tell you something. That's when the term Christian come into effect. You believe that? It was church of Antioch. They was there. They started preaching. That's correct. I said that's right. They started preaching, and what did Christian mean at that time? It meant, it meant, <laughs> it meant Christ-like. Folks, if Christian meant Christ-like when they developed it, it should mean Christ-like today. And you and I should happily stand up and tell somebody we are Christ-like. The problem is we fail that point. 
because we don't thrive hard enough for it. That's our problem. Because we got the, whole, the, the, the same Holy Spirit that Peter had when he stepped out of that two-story building. You hear me? It's the same one. We got saved by the same living Jesus Christ that gave his life on that cross and rose again. That is our Savior just like it was that 120s. And they got excited about it. You know why? Because they got on their knees in that hot building with no air, with a rock floor, tearing their knees up, all in one accord, praying to Jesus Christ. But you and I, you and I are such selfish people that we will not kneel down on a carpeted floor in one accord. And we let the world set a term for the word Christian. Whose fault is it? go back in chapter 2 at the first of it it says when the Holy Spirit come in that that these folks these 120 started talking now they were all talking in their language so people were gathered up and and they heard a noise because all the folks started talking in their language together okay so there would have been different languages that was being spoken my Bible says, understand this, and I believe this 100%. My Bible says there was a man from every nation there. How great is that? Do you understand what that means? There should not be a soul that has not heard about Jesus Christ. Should be. Because there was a man from every nation there. And what was great is that when the Holy Spirit come on, let me tell you how the Holy Spirit works. And I didn't realize this for a long, long time in my life. But everybody started hearing what they were saying in their own language. Okay? So what started out as a noise, when people started walking up and saying, oh, well, they're drunk, and they're, they're drunk people. They've been up there drinking a new wine. Nobody knows what they were saying. But when Peter stepped out and when he stepped out of that house, guess what? Jesus Christ come with him. The Holy Spirit come with him. And when Peter started preaching the word of God, everybody started hearing it in their own language. You think he's that big today? Amen, he is. Listen to me. We're dealing with the same Holy Spirit. We're dealing with the same Jesus Christ. Why are we so hesitant? Why are we so scared? Because we're worried about what the world thinks instead of what God thinks. And folks, we got a problem. Because it don't matter what the world thinks. It matters what our God thinks. That's who we're here for. I'm not here for you. I'm not here for my wife or my boys. I'm here because I want to serve my God. And that's where he told me to be. We got to get that going. We got to get that going. Peter stepped out of that two-story building. Why? Because that's where the Holy Spirit told him to go. And it said he stepped out there boldly. And he spoke he spoke the words of Jesus Christ. And folks, that's where it come in as a Christian. Well, that's a Christian. And you know what? Everywhere he went, that's a Christian. That's a Christian. And you know what? I believe Peter and Paul and all those other boys walked around and said, You know what? You're absolutely right. I'm a Christian and I'm proud of it. But we fall more in a category where they say, oh, well, that's a Christian. And we say, well, you know, that's my... What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a social pastor. I'm really not much of a Right? Is that where we're at in our lives? 
because we're more worried about what the world says. Listen, folks, when we get over what the world says and we get more about worried about what God says, this place will start turning around. You want this church house to fill up? Then start worrying about what God says and not what the world says. You want this church house to fill up? Then start worrying about doing the outreach that you and I are supposed to do as individuals and not worry about what our neighbors is going to think about us when we walk up and we knock on the door and say, Hey, do you know Jesus Christ? But we let the world give that definition too, right? Because used to, witnessing was going out And a Christian went out to witness for Jesus Christ. And he went out there and he told about Jesus Christ. And now the world changed the term Christian and gave us a new definition. And they also changed the word witness and gave us a new definition. So a Christian goes out to witness now and they invite people to church. Do you realize our job is not to invite people here? It's to tell them about Jesus. If they ask where we go, invite them here. But our first first goal is, hey, do you know Jesus? And listen, you say, brother, I can't do that. Mm -mm, Don't give me that look. Because Peter wasn't nothing but a sorry old fisherman. He smelt bad. He messed up. Sound familiar? That's what all of us are. We smell bad. We mess up. We got our good days. Amen. I took a shot last night. But folks, Peter and those 120, they defined what a Christian was. It was Christ-like. And people knew them Not just when they heard them, but when they seen them. Where are we at in our lives? Listen, I talk to my boys and I tell them, if you was walking around with a blind man, at the end of the day, everything that he heard, would he know you're a Christian? If you walked around with a deaf man, and at the end of the day, everything he saw, would he know you're a Christian? Folks, I fail at that sometimes. But the problem is, we got to admit it. You know why? Because we can't get better till we do. And there's a lot of us that are addicted to sin, and we don't want to let it go. We'd rather be all off in it, all smelling like it, and be all friends with the world than stand up for the word Christian. And that's why people are dying and going to hell each and every day. And that's why the world is gaining more and more and the churches are falling off. Because we're scared. And we have a Savior that stood toe to toe with Satan and shot him down. We have no right to be scared. So what do we do as a Christian? Folks, our job as a Christian is to be Christ-like. Well, brother, I can't be Christ-like. Yes, you can. Is it hard? Absolutely. Will people make fun of you? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, they will. Will your kids not like you sometimes? Absolutely. Will your wife be disgusted with you sometimes? Absolutely. Will your husband not like the wife sometimes? Absolutely. The Lord didn't say it was going to be easy. He said, you draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh unto you. You stick with me, and I'll get you through it. People tell me all the time, well, well, Brother Lord said he won't put nothing on you that you can't bear. Let me tell you, he won't as long as you draw a nigh unto him. But you leave him out of the picture, and guess what? Burdens get heavy. When the Lord's toting the load, you can keep on going. But if you're trying to do it by yourself, It's hard to get to church sometimes when we're doing it by ourselves. But you know, a Christian, someone that stands out, someone that stands up for Christ, someone that is like Christ, where do we fall in that category? 
Because I want you to look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you can look at all three of them. Matthew 26 is where we're going to be. Matthew 26 and 47. Let me read to you about a world Christian. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Now you can find that there. You can go to Mark chapter 14, verse 43. You can go to Luke chapter 22, verse 47. You can go to John chapter 7 or chapter 18, verse 1, and you can read the same thing. That Judas, one of the disciples, found that silver was more important than Jesus Christ. And you know, I dwelt on that a long time, and I thought, man, how? That's the other thought. How can a man trade Jesus Christ for 20 pieces of silver? 30, 20, 30, 20, 30, 30 pieces of silver. How? And I'm going to tell you another when I was in Israel, and we went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and I was sitting on a, a stone bench, and I was looking through the garden, and that's what I was thinking about was how. How could Judas trade Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver, walk up in this garden, kiss him on the cheek, and hand him to the, to the army? couldn't do that. And you know what? As I sat there on that bench, this is what I thought of. Man, I betrayed him for less. I betrayed him for a baseball game. I betrayed him for a fishing trip. I betrayed him for a friend I hadn't seen in a long time who needed Jesus. But I betrayed Jesus to go do that. I betrayed Jesus. Listen to me, folks. I betrayed Jesus for one silver can of a cold, cold beer. I betrayed him for a paycheck. I betrayed him for a family outing. And I thought, man, how could he betray him for 30 pieces of silver? I believe 30 pieces of silver is way more monetary valuable. valuable than anything I just named. But folks, Judas played a Christian. He walked every step Jesus Christ made. He listened to Jesus Christ, not Ben Britton, preach messages. He walked in his footsteps. He went where he went, he saw miracles firsthand on what Jesus could do. But he was playing a Christian. Let me tell you something. We can play Christian all we want to, but we are helping nobody. We are helping absolutely nobody. And by playing a Christian, we are sending people to hell. And we'll answer for it. 
We'll stand before Jesus Christ and we'll answer for it. Peter played a Christian a few times. I'm going to ask you this morning, are you playing a Christian or are you being a Christian? Because there's a big difference. That's where we're at. Nowhere else. Right now we're in Bay Lake Missionary Baptist Church and I'm asking you one question. Are you playing a Christian or are you being a Christian? And the only one that can answer that is you. And you know what? It's tough to answer sometimes. But until we answer it, Lord can't do nothing about it. But once we answer it, he can do everything about it. So that's your choice. And you have that choice. But here in about two seconds, you're going to have an opportunity. I'm asking the musicians and song leader to come forward. And we're going to have invitation. And I don't care if you hit your knees up here. I don't care if you hit your knees back there. But folks, if you're playing a Christian, I pray you hit your knees. And don't worry about what everybody else thinks about you. Because 90% of the time, they're waiting for somebody else to hit their knees where they can hit theirs.